Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our Options Education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the Chief Strategist here at Options Play and we are yet upon another earnings season. So today we're going to go over what our expectations are for this upcoming earnings season. What are the things that you need to be aware of as you're trading options around earnings, specifically around what, um, how the, how the, how the value of your option changes around earnings season so that you can account for them when you're anticipating what the potential outcomes are for different option strategies, and then giving you a checklist of what I look for when I'm going into an earnings announcement to do research on an individual stock as to trying to make an educated guess as to whether that stock is, has, has a higher probability of beating or potentially missing on earnings, giving you a checklist of the things that I look for before I place every single options trade so that you can hopefully also become informed and do your own research when you have a specific idea. So before we get started, what we are going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any of the specific securities that we are going to discuss during today's session. So we'll start off by taking a look at the Q2, Q3 earnings preview. We'll take a look at what happened last quarter in Q2, and then look at what our expectations are for Q3 this year. Then we'll talk a little bit about the difference between buying versus selling an option going into an earnings announcement. Largely, you have the choice of either buying because you think the stock's going to make a big move, or you have the option of selling because the implied volatility is high. There are pros and cons to each one. I want to make sure you understand that, uh, at least from a conceptual perspective. And then we're going to dive into the Greek so that you can actually get some numbers around these different factors that are going to affect your options around earnings. And I'll show you my earnings research checklist that I go through to gain a better understanding as to which stocks may have a better probability of beating versus missing earnings. And lastly, trying to go through a few examples to hopefully help uh, bring home the point before we open this for Q&A here at the very end. But the primary thing that I want to help you walk away from today's session is a clear understanding as to how you can research and trade earnings season with limited risk using options. So let's go ahead and get started. And let's first talk about the Q3 earnings preview. And before we jump into what our expectations are for Q3, let's talk a little bit about what happened in Q2. So we saw an 88% uh, increase in earnings per share for the S&P 500 stocks, 23% increase year over year in sales. Now, this is some of the largest gains we've seen simply because Q2 of last year was arguably one of the worst quarters in terms of decline for both earnings and revenues. So a record uh, growth here is not surprising. What was in, important for us to pay attention to was the fact that a, 10 out of 11 sectors did end up beating consensus, one of the best quarters we've seen so far. 72% of all S&P 500 companies beat on both top and bottom line. So largely one of the better uh, earnings seasons on, on, on record uh, that we have seen in terms of number of companies or percentage of companies that were able to beat both top and bottom line uh, revenue and earnings per share. But the biggest thing that I think is um, concerning for investors to see was not necessarily how companies uh, beat or missed on earnings, but more importantly, how did stocks react to those beats and misses. And this is really where we, I have not seen these types of skewed numbers as far as I remember in terms of earnings season. Stocks that beat on earnings only moved on average of 0.3% higher. And stocks that missed on earnings saw such a substantial miss, a negative 2.3% on misses. So this is really where we have seen a big skew in terms of not just how companies perform, but how markets reacted after those performance numbers. So this is something that we're going to pay attention to because these, the, we saw a smaller and smaller beats and bigger and bigger misses over the past couple of quarters. This really gives us a sense for what's priced into the market. So last quarter, there was a lot of optimism priced into the market. So when, when stocks beat, they barely nudged higher. Stocks that miss, because that optimism was so high, they had an incredible move here to the downside. Now, so far this particular earnings season, we've seen somewhat similar uh, you know, outcomes in terms of 
of uh, how stocks have reacted, but it is still pretty early days in this particular quarter. So, so far, our expectation is about a 27% increase uh, on EPS versus Q3 of last year versus 88% for Q2. So substantially lower um, increase in terms of expectations. And the one thing that we really have to consider is the fact that consensus forecasts, this particular forecast of 27% increase in EPS, this has actually fallen fairly sharply over the past month or so. And this is largely due to the supply chain issues that we continue to see and the inflation, the cost of goods and labor that continue to uh, ha you know, has have shown no form of easing in the current quarter. And you know, while a lot of companies had expected that this would start to ease towards the end of the year so far, this does not look like that's going to happen. It looks like it's going to actually get worse going into the end of the year. So this is really some of the biggest, I would say, downside pressures on this particular earnings season. But it also means that the expectations for this particular quarter at the moment has been lowered. So the bar has been lowered in terms of expectations. So when we do see companies that beat, my expectation is that we're going to see larger reactions to beats, um, but we're also going to see some fairly sizable misses because companies, I think there's you're going to see a lot of huge moves in the, in the um, consumer space because companies that are able to manage their supply chain and, and pass on their uh, rise in, in, in labor and, and, and cost of goods to the consumer, those are the ones that are going to surprise us to the upside. And then you're going to see some companies that do not fare so well in this particular space where they get squeezed out in the supply chain. They're not able to pass on their uh, rising costs onto the consumer. And those are the ones we're going to see perhaps some big disappointments here. So the consumer consumer space, because supply chain and inflation is going to be a big issue this particular quarter, in my opinion, you're going to see some big moves there. When we look at what has reported so far, predominantly, uh, we have seen the banks report mostly last week. And 85% of the banks that have reported have beat on both sales and revenue consensus. So this was a fairly strong start to the quarter with the banks showing quite a bit of strength here. And we'll have to see whether this continues into the, um, the rest of the market. So Let's take a look at the sectors for this particular quarter. When we look at which sectors have seen the largest upward revisions, so analysts who have revised their sales and EPS targets for this particular quarter, uh, technology, energy, and real estate are the three sectors that have seen the most amount of upward revisions. So analysts who have looked at the company, looked at kind of what's happened over the particular quarter, and put in their estimates as to where they think these companies will end up, both in terms of revenue and in terms of earnings. On the flip side, we look at sectors where we've seen analysts revise those expectations to the downside. And that's where we've seen most of that revision in the utility space and the consumer sectors. And again, this, this goes back to our su uh, supply and inflation numbers here uh, with respect to these um, consumer sectors that are likely going to see some downside pressures from the supply chain and uh, you know cost of goods and cost of labor here at the moment. So when we think about trading options for around earnings, the most important thing to to understand are the three main factors that will affect the value of an option going into an earnings announcement. So we're going to break this up into buying options and selling options. So when we talk about buying options, we're largely trying to take limited risk in exchange for unlimited reward. Now, this has the benefit of having limited risk so that if you're wrong in the direction, you contain how much risk you take and you have the benefit of if you get the direction correct, you get unlimited upside in theory. So, however, there are some drawbacks to this risk this asymmetrical risk to reward ratio that's skewed in your favor. So when we're talking about buying options, I consider this as one step forward with two steps back. What that means is that when you're buying an option, you have this asymmetric risk to reward where you have limited risk and unlimited profit potential. And basically if you get the directional view correct, so if you think the stock's going to beat on earnings and the stock makes a big move to the upside, well, you're gonna be able to have a large gain in the underlying uh, position based on your estimate of whether the stock is going to beat or miss. However, at the same time, there's gonna be two other factors 
that are going to be working against you when you have this asymmetric risk to reward ratio. The first one is volatility crush. The second one is time decay. So volatility crush refers to the implied volatility of an option prior to earnings is going to be elevated. And that's because the implied volatility, the uncertainty around what's going to happen on that earnings announcement is high around before an earnings. So the, the premium that's going to be needed to purchase that call or put option needs to be higher because the person who's on the other side of that trade, the seller of that call or put, needs to be compensated for taking on the risk to the other side. And that's why whenever you're buying an option going into earnings, you're going to have higher option premiums or higher implied volatility. Now, once the earnings announcement comes out, that uncertainty factor is gone. We know exactly how much the company made in terms of revenue, how much they earned in terms of profit or loss, and that uncertainty goes away. So the implied volatility option naturally decreases immediately after the earnings announcement. That's what we call to volatility crush. And that's going to work against you as the buyer of an option. So if you buy an option that's $3 prior to earnings, even if the stock doesn't move, you will expect that that option will be worth less the very next day just because of the uncertainty factor is gone. And that's going to work against you as the buyer of that option. Because when you buy an option, you want the option to increase in value, not decrease in value, which is what the volatility crush does. And then you also have time decay because you have to buy the option prior to earnings and then you have to sell the options after the earnings. During that time period, you're holding on to that option. You're going to have time decay during that time. So as an options buyer, you have these two factors working against you. They're constantly working against you. They'll always work against you. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to pick options or specifically stocks that you think that you're going to get a large enough move in the underlying stock that's going to raise the value of the option faster than what's going to be lost to volatility crush and time decay. So this is where you have one potential thing working in your favor that's going to offset the two things that are working against you. That's how you can profit. Now, if you get the directional view wrong, meaning if you think the stock's going to beat, but it misses, guess what? Now you have three factors working against you. You have the price of the stock working against you, you have volatility crush, and you have time decay working against you. So it's a really difficult proposition to find these stocks that you think are going to make such a big move that the gains that you have in the underlying stock and subsequently the option will offset the volatility crush and the time decay. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type one into the chat window if that makes sense to you. And it's quite difficult, in my opinion, to pinpoint stocks that you think are going to do exactly this, which is effectively beating what the market is anticipating it is going to do. But we see it time and time after every single quarter. You see stocks that make 10, 15, 20% jumps after earnings because the market got it wrong. And if you're able to pick those stocks, this is how you can potentially profit from that. Okay. Now, on the flip side, you might say to yourself, it's really rare that you're going to be able to pick out those types of scenarios. So perhaps you might favor something else, selling options. This is really where, well, you can have two things working in your favor. You have two steps forward and one potentially massive step back. So when you're selling an option, you have the opposite of, of buying an option, which is limited risk with unlimited reward. When you're selling an option, you have limited reward and potentially unlimited risk. So when you're selling an option, the good thing is that what works against an options buyer, that's going to be start that's going to work in your favor. You're selling an option. You know that the option will experience some volatility crush on earnings. So the value of the option that you've sold will naturally decrease after the earnings announcement. And you also have time decay. So while you hold on to it, the value of the option will simply decay just with time. So if the stock doesn't move, you'll still be profitable just on time decay. And now you add volatility crush on top of that. Those are two things that are working in your favor. And when you're selling an option, what you're trying to pinpoint are stocks that are not going to make huge moves, certainly not huge moves in the opposite direction that you expect it to. So if you're selling a put, you're hoping that the stock doesn't decline substantially. If you're selling a call, you're hoping that the stock doesn't rise substantially. 
So when you're selling an option, what you're hoping is that the volatility crush and the time decay that you're going to collect on selling that option will be larger than any adverse move in the underlying stock. So does that make sense, everyone? Please type two into the chat window if that makes sense to you. Now, the question is, from a lot of traders and viewers, is which one's better? And the answer is one is not better than the other. They're just different. It depends on what your view is in going into earnings. Some stocks you think are going to make a big move and you're trying to capture it. Well, those you should probably look at buying options. Other ones you think it's not going to make a big move or you're fairly confident that it's going to make a, 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 you know, a, size, a, a small move in one direction or other, you might be better off selling options. And remember, you, can't, you don't have to just outright buy a call or sell a put or buy a call or, or uh, buy a call or sell a put or vice versa. You can trade spreads as well, right? So when we refer to buying options, you know, we could buy a debit spread. You could buy a, a calendar or diagonal spread. Those are just variations of buying options that help offset some of the volatility crush and time decay. But vice versa, you can, instead of just selling a naked call or a put, you could sell a credit spread, you could sell an iron condor. There are other options selling strategies, but the core the core fundamental understanding that you need to have are these two factors, or these three factors that are either working in your favor or against you as an, as an option buyer or sell them. So just to put some of these, some, some context around theory, because what we've talked about so far is just theory. To put some real numbers behind it, we have to dive into the Greeks. And there are three Greeks that are very important around earnings, Delta, Vega, and Theta. Those are the three things we, were, we, were, we referred to, the stock moving substantially higher or lower, changes in implied volatility, the volatility crush, and time decay. Those are the three factors that we talked about. And these Greeks help us quantify those three factors. So if you're looking at an option with the delta of 0 0.5, that means for every $1 the stock moves, the option will move by half as much or 50 cents. So if you have a stock that moves $10 on earnings and you have a delta of 0 0.5, then you're expecting that the value of your option will increase by let's say $5. Stock jumps $10 on earnings, you make a $5 profit on that earnings. That's what Delta approximates for you. And then you have to add Vega into this. Uh, so Vega tells you for every 1% change in implied volatility, how much does the value of the option change by? So Vega of 0 0.25 means for every 1% change in implied volatility, you'll see a 25 cent drop in the, uh, in the value of an option. So if you buy this call option prior to earnings, um, let's say you buy the option for, let's say, $3. Sorry, let's say you buy the option for $5. Um, you buy the option for $5. And on earnings, it increases, uh, the stock level increases by $10. So the value of your option increases by $5. So now the value of your total option is worth $10. So the stock makes a $10 jump. The $5 option that you buy increases by $5. So now you have an option that's worth $10. Now, we know that volatility crush comes into play. Let's say you have a stock that's currently at 25% uh, implied vol. And after earnings, the stock drops to 20% implied volatility. So if you have a vega of 0 0.25, that translates to a loss of about $1.50 in vega because for every 1% you drop in value, sorry, $1.25, sorry. Um, $1.25 in value is lost due to the volatility crush. And then let's say you add theta to it, a theta of 0 0.1. That means for every day that goes by, you lose 10 cents. Let's say you held on to this trade for a total of five days. That means you now lost another 50 cents on the option. So if you lost a total of basically $1.75 out of the $10, which means that the value of your option now is worth $8.25. So this is how you can value the value of your option. So you make $5 on Delta, you lose $1.25 to volatility crush, you lose 50 cents to time decay, you're left with $8.25. So the net profit that you made on this particular trade was $3.25. So the question is, can you do the math on your own if you are trading an option on uh, through through uh, earnings, and the good point, the good part about this is that you don't have to do the math. 
Um, our platform does the math for you. So let's take a look at a, an example of this. I'm going to look at AMD, for example. AMD recently is starting to see some big moves here to the upside, revisiting the, the recent all-time highs. Maybe this reports earnings next week. And you want to know how does this stock perform if I was to, if I'm expecting that AMD is going to blow it out of the water here and it's going to jump substantially on earnings. Well, you can use the PL simulator within options play, the PL simulator. And what we have are three triggers. You have the price, you have the date, and you have implied volatility. Those are the three sliders that are actually going to calculate delta, vega, and theta for you and show you the impact of these three factors on the value of your option going into earnings. So let's say going into earnings, I want to buy a November and you can structure any strategy that you want. You don't have to use the ones that I'm looking at. But let's say you buy a November 120 call. Uh, the stock's currently trading at 119. You buy an at the money call. It costs you $5.45. And what you want to do is you want to say, what happens if the stock jumps to 135? 135, a few days after earnings. So earnings is on October 26. So if let's say on October let's say November 2nd, a week after earnings, the stock is at 135 and the current implied volatility is a 40%. Now, there isn't an exact science as to how much the implied volatility will collapse by, but generally speaking, I like to take at least 10 to 20% off of the current implied volatility to get a good sense for roughly what the implied volatility would look like. So I'm going to move it from 40% to 33%. So about almost 20% of the, of the current implied vol I'm going to take off. And what this shows me is that the value of my option will increase by $978 or about $179 profit if I get the directional view correct and the stock jumps to 135 by the November 2nd expiration. Uh, I'm sorry, by the November 2nd date. And I factored into the volatility crush of about a decline of about 7% here. And, and you can use these sliders to see how time affects the value of your option. As you can see, you know, on November 2nd, because I'm trading a November 19th option, between now and the expiration date, uh, there's some value that's going to get lost uh, as I hold this to expiration. And past the expiration date of 19th, I'm not going to see anything, any else changes in terms of time because on November 19th, that's when the value of my option is, um, is done, right? And you can also see what happens if volatility crush doesn't happen. How big of a difference does that have on the value of your option? As you can see, currently at 40%, I'll make a $1,000 profit. But if it goes down to 33%, I'll make $9,978. So volatility crush has an effect on your option, but it's not huge. Um, so it's important to understand that the vega is going to change the value of your option by a small amount. Theta is also going to change the value of your option by a small amount. What's not going to change the value of your option by a small amount is delta. Delta has a huge effect on the value of your option because if the stock only moves up to 130, here, that's the difference between a $500 profit and a $1,000 profit. So you really have to understand roughly how far you think the stock can move, what's a realistic move. And that's really where you can turn to the implied volatility of an option. And we even have a trading range simulator that gives you a sense for how far can the stock potentially move between now and the expiration date. So if I move it to the November 19th expiration date, I'll see that the one standard deviation move is $133. That is potentially a reasonable target if I think the stock's going to make a big move. So if I think by uh, November 19th, uh, November 19th, the stock can move up to 133 and the stock uh, has some volatility crush. This is probably a more realistic expectation as to what can happen between now and expiration on a stock like AMD. And I'm just using a simple call option to show you, but you can use a debit spread, you can use a calendar, a diagonal, a credit spread. You can do all of these things using our platform. You can set up different strategies side by side and see how they perform in this, in this scenario, that if the stock reaches 133 by the November 19th expiration and volatility com comes down, what is your expected profit? What is your expected loss? 
the credit spread risk 542, the debit spread, uh, the call option risk 542, uh, 545, and the debit spread uh, risk 713. And you can kind of see what happens if the stock moves higher, how much do I potentially make? What if it stays the same? What if it moves lower? How much am I risking? These things are going to be important for you to understand. And it's just important to understand these three factors. These three factors are going to change the value of your option around earnings. And the big thing you really have to adjust for is that volatility crush. Um, you know, otherwise, I think time and price, most traders are familiar with, but that volatility, that's the component that I think is a little trickier. So hopefully this gives you an understanding as to how volatility affects the value of your option. So let's now dive into, uh, you know, how do you go about researching an earnings announcement? And so this is really where we start with our earnings calendar, because an earnings calendar can really help you, number one, narrow down what symbols should you pay attention to. So we have an earnings calendar that you can find on the Options Play platform when you go to Education and Resources, which takes you to the Options Play hub. And if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, there is an earnings calendar tab. And if you click on the earnings calendar, it's going to give you a view that looks like this. And it might seem like a lot of things at first, but it's really easy to understand. You have your dates going across, right? So chronologically, you know that today is the, 20, uh, the 21st. This is today. So obviously, anything that's, ha that's happened in the past doesn't apply. You're really looking at stuff that's, that, that are in the future. So for example, I, I might look at the stuff that's happening on the 22nd, the 25th, the 26th. Those are really where I'm going to focus my attention on when it comes to research. Now, when you get into the meat of earnings season, which is next week and the week after, there's a lot of reports on a given day. It's hard to know out of the hundreds of symbols, where do you focus your attention on? And that's why we created this color-coded map for you. It's color-coded based on liquidity. So it's based on, you have your dates up top. So you know, you know, there's no need for me to look at these dates out here because these don't report until, uh, you know, the following week. I'm going to focus my attention mostly on, you know, these here, maybe some of these and maybe some of these. That's where I'm going to focus my attention on researching. And if you're really intent on researching, you want to make sure that you narrow down your list first. So the first thing you want to know is on what day does it report and does it report before the market? or after the market. So the ones that have the asterisk are the ones that report before the market opening, which means that you have to have a position open prior to the previous, uh, you know, during the previous day, right? So if GE reports on the morning of the 26th, you have to have an open position on the 25th before you can get exposure to that earnings announcement. So it's really important to know what day they're reporting, whether it's before a market, before or after, the ones with an asterisk are the ones that are before, the ones without the asterisk are the ones that report after the close. Next, you want to look at liquidity. So everything that's highlighted in green are what we consider very liquid symbols. Those are the ones that I predominantly spend my time researching, especially in the meat of earnings season where there are plenty of liquid symbols. There's just no need for us to dig that deep into the less liquid symbols. Now, as you get later and later into the earnings season and there's fewer and fewer reports, if you're still trying to trade earnings season, you may have to start looking into those secondary less liquid symbols. But during the meat of earnings season, each day you can you have a finite list, right? So here I've narrowed down from the few hundred names that report on the 26 to just in this particular case, about 25 names or so to look at. And out of the 20 25, maybe 10 or 12 of them I'm familiar with. And I'm, you know, I, I know I can dig into the research and trade. This is going to help me substantially narrow down the symbols that I take a look at. So the earnings calendar is always the first place I start all of my research with respect to earnings. Once I have a specific symbol I want to take a look at, this is really where we start digging into it. And I always tell traders the first thing you should look at. In, in an earnings announcement is an understanding as to how the company is doing in terms of trends for revenue and in terms of earnings, because those are the things that are being reported in this particular quarter. And it's good to know how is the stock performing in historical quarters. So this is JPM. JPM just recorded last month. And what might be surprising to most traders is that just the consistent downtrend we've seen in revenue decline even prior to the pandemic. So if you look at prior to the pandemic, we were seeing revenue decline, and this has only continued. And what you know, we have this research here. Now, 
you can find these types of charts and, and numbers from pretty much all of your brokerage firms. You have access to financial statements, you have access to historical um, charts that show you just a general trend. It's really important just to know, is a company growing their revenues? Are they growing their earnings? Because those are the two primary things you should be looking for if you think a company is beating because they have a track record of performing well in terms of growing their revenues. Or is a company, you know, in this particular case, like JP Morgan, they're actually making less and less money in terms of revenue, but they're increasing their, their, their um, earnings. You know, this really tells me that's more coming from cutting expenses rather than really growing their company. And that's not particularly what I love looking for going into an earnings announcement. So it's just important to, you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to, from this chart, know how what a company is going to do next quarter, but it gives you some overall context of how is the company performing from a, from a financial perspective, perspective, because that's what you're guessing, right? You're guessing whether the company has a good shot of, of beating earnings or not. Now, JP Morgan, you know, as you can see, struggled for a few quarters, but really started to accelerate their earnings over the past three quarters. And I usually look at trailing 12 months. I usually don't look at individual quarters because there's a lot of noise going from one quarter to the next quarter. So when you look at trailing 12 months, what you're looking at is a summary of last four quarters. So when I see that, that whoops, when I see that JP Morgan has made $128 billion, that's referring to making $128 billion over the last four quarters combined. This filters out some of the seasonality. If you see some of the, especially the consumer related stocks, they make most of their profits in that last quarter during Christmas season, and they don't make a lot of money in Q1. So when you when you see those big jumps in, from quarter over quarter, it's hard to really get a sense for whether a company is trending in the right direction or not. So that's why I use trailing 12 months. Trailing 12 months um, smooths out that seasonality um, uh, across certain sectors. So, you know, many sectors, you just have that seasonality where a company books most of their profits in a specific quarter. Um, and by using trailing 12 months, you're, 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 you're um, smoothing out that. Um, so what I'm really seeing is just an overall trend, even though individual quarters, they may have quite a bit of noise in between. And earnings also, earnings is extremely noisy. And the best way to kind of cancel out that noise to some degree or smooth it out is by looking at trailing 12 months. How much money did the company make in the last 12 months? And what does that compare to the previous 12 months? Are they consistently growing that? And JP Morgan is consistently growing earnings, which arguably between the two numbers is the more important number. Profit is more important than revenue. But I generally don't like to see a company that's generating more and more profits with declining revenue, because that tells me that the company is doing something wrong, that their revenues are declining, but their revenue, but they're still able to manufacture earnings. Those are really more what I would consider manufactured earnings. That can go on for quite some time, but at some point, there's a limit as to how much you can manufacture earnings. Does that make sense? Please type three into the chat window if that makes sense to you. Perfect. So again, first and foremost, understanding the fundamentals. Then you can look at kind of what the expectations are for this upcoming quarter, right? Because this so far, when you look at charts like this, this is just historical analysis, understanding what's happened in the past. But it's also important to understand what our analyst expectations are uh, going to be. And, you know, you, there's plenty of resources for this as well. Pretty much every single brokerage firm offers some kind of research portal that gives you an understanding as to what the analyst expectations are. I use a platform called Estimize, which gives me access not only to the Wall Street consensus, which is what the analysts are expecting, but also a, a consensus across the users of the Estimize platform, of which anyone can join this platform, submit their expectations for the quarter, whether they think the stock's going to beat or miss, and they, it, it it basically takes into account all of those views and gives you a sense for whether a company perhaps may be beating uh, or missing. And generally speaking, what we're most interested in is not necessarily the estimate itself, but we're interested in how that estimate has changed over time. We tend to see that when there's a lot of upward revisions going into an earnings announcement, there's a higher chance that the stock is going to beat earnings when there's an estimate, when there are plenty of estimate revisions to the downside. So maybe the, you know, we started off uh, expecting that the company was going to make 80 cents, but you know, over the past few weeks, that's now declined to 73 cents. 
that's not a good sign or vice versa. If the company, if everyone expected that they're going to make 66 cents, but now over the past few weeks, that's now increased to 73 cents. That's a good sign. So estimate revisions are important factor in determining whether a stock potentially is going to beat or miss. And there's been a lot of empirical research on this front to show that estimate, estimate revisions heading into an earnings announcement, especially in the last couple of weeks, is many times a very good predictor of whether a company may beat or miss on a specific earnings announcement. Then, you know, so, so that's kind of the fundamental factors, right? And those are, at the end of the day, these are more art than science, if you will. It's really just having a sense for how a company has been doing and what your expectations are going forward. Um, and there's not a lot of data behind that. But when you look at the stock chart, that's effectively the entire market weighing in what their thoughts are going into an earnings announcement. And there's quite a bit of information that you can kind of gather from that when, from looking just at the chart itself. And what, you know, and what's more important for me is not less so as less so the chart itself, but relative to the sector and relative to the market. That is really kind of what I predominantly look for going into an earnings announcement. I have two charts here, two semiconductor stocks. I have Texas Instruments and I have AMD. I'm gonna show you both. And what you're gonna see here is that Texas Instruments recently made a new all-time high. Uh, the last high was two, uh, basically just shy of 201. And we recently today just pierced above that to 201.19. So today, Texas Instruments made a new all-time high. So higher high in price, but what I have here is a chart of Texas Instruments relative to the S&P 500 and relative to the technology sector. You can use sector, you can use semiconductor industry um, if you want to get more granular. But the important thing to me is the fact that as Texas Instruments made a new high, it failed to make a new high relative to the market and failed to make a new high relative to its sector. What this is telling me is that despite the fact that the stock made a new recent high over the past month or so, it's actually underperforming the market and underperforming its sector. So imagine if you're a portfolio manager, you have hundreds of stocks in your portfolio, and here's a stock that can't keep up with the market. It can't keep up with its sector. Think about, you know, is this a stock that you think you're going to keep around in your portfolio for a long, long time if the stock continues to underperform its sector and its market, especially going into an earnings announcement. This is really some of the information that I think is most important to look at going into an earnings announcement. How is it performing relative to the market? Because stocks that are underperforming the market, why should I keep Texas Instruments that's going to give me a 1% gain over the last month if the market is up 4 or 5% over that month or the technology sector that it's part of is up 4 or 5%? And this is really where you have to think about how institutional money managers think. They only want to own stocks that are outperforming the market because that's what they are paid to do. They're, they're paid to outperform the market and stocks that don't outperform the market, those are not the ones that are going to be in favor. Conversely, if we look at AMD, another semiconductor stock, we see similar price action in terms of AMD recently making a higher high. But what you see here is over the past couple of weeks, AMD has outperformed the market and has outperformed its sector. So this is a stock that performing well, and not only performing well, performing well relative to the other stocks that I own in my portfolio or the other stocks that I have in my, uh, in my asset management company, right? Think BlackRock, think all of these major firms that have, made, that have billions of dollars of, uh, under, billions of dollars of assets under management. They have hundreds of stocks in their portfolio. What are they more likely to hold going into earnings? A stock that's outperforming the rest of their holdings or a stock that's underperforming the rest of their holdings? And this is something that I, that I look for almost in every single one of my earnings plays. Now, this does not mean that the market is going, that it's going to outperform uh, the, uh, it's going to beat estimates. And it doesn't necessarily even mean that when the stock if it, the stock does beat estimates, that it's going to rise because sometimes we see stocks beat estimates and the stock declines, right? So this is really some of the 
science and the art, if you will, that you're playing with. At the end of the day, you don't have a crystal ball, but these are the different things that you can look for to hopefully help stack the cards in your favor. The more of these things you can stack in your favor, the higher the probability you'll be able to get the directional view right. So looking at relative strength to the market and the sector is really looking at what is the market telling you about this particular stock and their chances of beating earnings, because you're likely going to see more buyers of stocks that they that the market thinks is going to beat and less likely buying of stock that that the market thinks is not going to beat and here's a, a prime example of texas instruments versus amd two semiconductor stocks that are both reporting next week clear difference in terms of price performance telling you something about how the market is expecting these two stocks to play out Keep in mind, the markets are wrong sometimes, right? And that's why we see big moves in the underlying stock when the stock, when the market gets it wrong because the market effectively mispriced what is going to happen. But that is how you can, you can try to get some information from what is the market thinking going into an earnings announcement? Does that make sense? Please type four into the chat window if that makes sense to you. And lastly, I cannot help but... And, and I, I, I can't stress this enough. Um, and I say this across, you know, whether you're trading earnings, whether you're not trading earnings, just investing in different stocks, understand what a company does fundamentally. Never trade a stock, never invest in a stock, never uh, buy an option on a stock. If you don't know what the company does, um, you know, and you know, you all trade at brokerage firms that provide you with research. Use that research. If you're going to buy a stock, if you're going to buy an option on a stock, at least know what it does, um, because that that can sometimes just give you that that conviction of whether this is the stock that's right for your portfolio, or maybe you know you know you might have read something somewhere where you just think that you know hey this is not the type of company that I think is going to do very well in this environment. And sometimes that comes down to gut feel, but if you don't have this information, you're never going to be able to make that decision, right? So you see a company like AMD, where you might see more and more of their chips in, in PCs. You see that they're mostly in server and cloud chips, and they're making bigger, bigger market share in cloud, cloud um, computing. And you know that cloud computing is extremely strong because maybe you're invested in Microsoft and Amazon and, and, and uh, Salesforce. And you know that AMD is one of the, the, you know, the, the chips that power all of that. You're more likely to have some conviction behind Behind this versus when you look at Texas Instruments, they don't make any of those types of chips. They make very low processes, low processing type chips, and there's demand for that as well. But you know, this also helps you just understand why you are bullish about a specific stock or why you think a stock may have a chance of outperforming the rest of their peers. And the only way you can make that conviction or make that guess, if you will, is by understanding what the company does. So I encourage you to read this research. It's available to you at pretty much all of the major broker terms, whether you get it from CFRA or S&P or Morningstar, or, you know, there's a, a variety of research firms that provide this type of content that are available to you for free from your broker terms. Read that stuff. It's going to help you become a better investor overall if you do understand what the company actually does. You know, especially in these high growth tech startups, I see a lot of traders trade or invest in stocks. They have no idea what the product is. Um, and that's really kind of a, a disservice in my opinion to invest or trade in stuff that you don't know what they do. So with that, um, hopefully I'll be able to show you just one more example here. And we'll go back to Texas Instruments. So if I'm looking at Texas Instruments and I see how it's underperforming the broader markets here, this is really where I might be looking at a stock like Texas Instruments and uh, look at this particular stock and maybe say, you know, I don't think the stock is going to uh, to uh, beat earnings. I think it is going to be more modest. Um, I don't, we all saw what happened with um, uh, IBM here last week. Um, so, uh, or yesterday rather, maybe you want to take a more neutral view here. You might want to sell a credit spread or something like that. And you can use this tool again to Take a look at buying a put versus selling a credit spread versus buying a debit spread, anticipating what the potential moves could be using the trading range simulator. You can simulate based on the November 19th expiration. The downside move, the expected move is about 187 and a half. And you can use those as potential targets, meaning if you'd think that the stock's going to reach 175, 
Guess what? That's not likely to happen, at least not by the November 19th expiration. Uh, more realistic was that 187 and a half. That's a more realistic expectation. So don't go moving this stuff down here and saying, oh, I know I can make 159% return. Yes, that's possible, but not very likely. A far more likely outcome is something like this, where you make a 67% return. And you might say to yourself, well, this vertical spread here makes a 94% return. So this is how you can use this tool, plug in your potential outcomes, uh, especially, most importantly, account for volatility crush, account for the fact that that stock is going to decrease in value in terms of the implied volatility option. And that's going to help you become a much better trader around earnings because you will have a much better understanding as to how the value of your option will be affected by earnings. So with that, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today. I hope that this was helpful in giving you a better understanding as to trading earnings and the, the process that I go through, the checklist that I go through uh, in, in determining whether I think a stock is going to potentially beat or miss on earnings. And I want to thank our members for uh, supporting us and allowing us to continue to put out this type of research and education for everyone to learn more about options and trading options. So if you want to sign up for a free 30-day trial for everything that our members have access to, you can do so at optionsplay.com. You'll get access to our daily trading signals. You'll get a free 30-day trial to the full platform that I showed you here today so that you can analyze these trades based on that implied volatility crush. And you're going to be able to join us every single Thursday for these options education sessions. So with that, I'm going to open this up for Q&A here. At the, um, there is both a chat window and a Q&A section. If you want to type your questions in the Q&A section, I'll try to answer any questions you might have before I jump here for today. Uh, Jock is saying a company has jumped 10% since its earnings beat as of yesterday. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't taken a look at that earnings announcement, so I cannot really comment on that. Um, just did a debit spread on JPM, lasted two days before earnings worked out okay. Thank you for sharing that, Ken. Um, Netflix before trade was actually profitable today. That's, that's correct. Um, maybe some of you held on to that butterfly, but I did not expect Netflix to jump after you know what was a strong earnings announcement. The stock just did not react well to that earnings announcement. Even though it was a strong earnings announcement, the stock jumped substantially here today. I hope some of you were able to hold on to it and maybe take a profit on that. Um, you know, we were up about 50% uh, earlier today on that butterfly. Uh, Ken is saying, where do you find charts for relative strength to sectors? So Ken, currently, you know, I can suggest using stockcharts.com. It is a free resource that anyone can have access to, and you can put on relative charts on stockcharts.com. Um, so that is one resource that I can point you to, but we are working on integrating relative charts on our platform as well. Will you do a class on how to read financial statements to know what is important and what is not? So, you know, Rich, uh, the Richers, uh, I will say that you can really drive yourself nuts trying to read financial statements. Um, I'm not a huge fan of going too deep into the financial statements. As you can see, when you look at trailing 12-month revenue and trailing 12-month EPS, what I look at is what is the overall trend over the last eight quarters and what is the trend over the last three quarters? That's what these two, uh, the, the blue line and the, and the yellow line tell us. It tells us what has happened over the last eight quarters, what is the general trend, and has the recent trend been better or worse? So as you can see from a revenue perspective, uh, the company basically has a decline on average of about 1.37% every single quarter, uh, or every, every single 12 months period, when you roll that forward one quarter, JP Morgan's um, revenue has declined by an average of about 1.37% per quarter. Over the past three quarters, it's declined by 1.6%. So from my perspective, nothing has really changed from a revenue perspective from the recent past versus what's averaged over the last eight quarters. On the earnings side, you've seen a small acceleration in terms of earnings. They've grown earnings on average about 9.2% per quarter. Uh, in the last three quarters, they've accelerated that to about 12.73%. That's more meaningful. But like I said, you know what's most really more important is the overall trend. Revenue is trending in the wrong direction. 
earnings is trending in the right direction, that can't go on for too long because you can't just make more and more profits on less and less revenue. Um, you can get more efficient. You can decrease expenses. Those are those are legitimate things for a company to do, and those are good things. But you really need to start to see this this revenue start to pick up or at least plateau. Um, and and because those because there are plenty of companies that are increasing their revenues and earnings. Those are ones that are going to be more attractive. So those are the primary things that I look for. Uh, yes, we do have a recording of this webinar and you'll be able to receive both the slides and the recording after we finish here today. Um, you know, someone talked about SNAP uh, earnings down. You know, one of the things that you can look at for SNAP, if I'm not mistaken, when I looked at SNAP earlier, um, it, it was underperforming, you know, the market. You know, that's one of the things that we did see in Snapchat. Uh, you know, if we look at Snap relative, you know, it, it's it's making sideways and then relative to the market, it was a little bit down. This, you know, we haven't seen any real outperformance of Snap relative to its uh, to the market and relative to the sector. Uh, so both Snap, as you can see, flat relative to the stock, relative to a sector. There's really not. There wasn't a lot of information going to Snap to really um, make that judgment call. Uh, revenue is what they make and earnings is what they profited from that. So if you make a dollar and you're able to make a 50 cent profit from that, um, you know, minus expenses. So revenue is how much you brought in minus expenses is your overall profit. Um, and, and that is a very oversimplified uh, way to think about the markets, um, to be honest. Uh, thoughts on Costco. Costco has moved substantially higher here. I think it's time to cut losses on Costco. Um, we will be sending out an alert on that very shortly. How about some stocks that have historically run up before earnings? So you do have to factor that in, right? When you look at AMD, it's made a very big run going into earnings. And you might factor that in and say it's made such a big run. I think there's a limit as to how much higher it can go. So that might be where you're more inclined to sell options rather than buy options going into earnings, just because you know, you're concerned about how much higher the stock can go rather than buying options where the stock needs to make a bigger move to break even. So yes, you do have to take that into account. What do you think about low delta strangles prior to earnings? So Richard, there's a lot of traders that will trade low delta strangles. There's a high amount of risk in that, um, but it is a trade where you have effectively quadruple uh, factors working in your favor because you have the volatility crush and the time decay on both sides. And as long as the stock makes a big, doesn't make a big move, you'll be profitable. Um, it's just a risky strategy, but you do have a lot of things working in your favor. Uh, dividend announcements affect option strategies. Um, generally speaking, they don't unless they pay a really fat dividend from a dollar perspective, less so from a percentage perspective, because you do have low, higher risk of early assignment on certain strategies. Um, but generally speaking, dividends are not as um, as as important for for traders as it, as option as earnings are. Julie's asking, what do you consider low implied volatility? Um, you know, implied volatility is a relative term. So thirty percent might be relatively high for a stock like Walmart or. or um, uh, you know, I don't know, GE. Uh, but then when you look at stocks like Snapchat or Twitter or I don't know, um, even uh, Tesla, you know, 30% is on the low end. So um, you want to look at how the implied volatility of an option is relative to itself. You don't want to compare the implied volatility of one option to the implied volatility of another stock. Those are not great, great comparisons. You only want to compare implied volatilities of an option relative to its own history. Is implied volatility an estimate? No, it is an exact calculation. It's an exact calculation based on the, based on the, the, the price of the option. Uh, the market prices each option, right? Just the same way that the market prices the stock, all the buyers and sellers, you know, once you account for all the orders in there, the last recorded price is what the value of the option is, right? So an option has a price and that price is arrived at by all the buyers and the sellers coming into the marketplace and finding that natural equilibrium, if you will. So the implied volatility is just calculated off of that price. 
how many trades do you think we should play into earning session? So, I mean, that really depends on how much risk you're willing to take. You know, I generally think that, you know, maybe two to three a day, um, you know, especially if you're closing out each trade after earnings, after each earnings, you can trade two, three, four, five trades, uh, two, three trades a day. I think it's probably reasonable for most traders. Thinking of earnings next week, would you call our AMD with an expiration just past the earnings announcement or with a 30-day expiration? Generally speaking, I like to go out about 30 days past expiration. You should never use the expiration just past the earnings announcement. That's a great question, David. Where do you get your relative rotation charts from? I use stockcharts.com for it. Um, there aren't many places to get them other than Bloomberg, StarCharts.com, and a few other places. But StarCharts.com, sorry, is where most, I would say, retail traders get access to RRG, which is a relative rotation chart. Is it better to pick, take partial, partial profits and close a trade before the earnings announcement date? Um, Donald, you know, I, I don't think that there's a general best practice for that. The question is really whether or not you want to get exposure to the inner earnings announcement. That's going to determine whether you keep it open or close it before earnings. How do you feel about using short strangles? Um, so, you know, I, I talked about that a bit earlier before. Um, where can I find graphs shown on revenue and earnings trend analysis? So, Sandra, these are charts that we built ourselves, and we are currently in the process of working on an integrating into the options play platform. But these are these are you know these are not proprietary; these are publicly available numbers. Almost every brokerage firm provides some type of chart, if you will, to show you historical um, revenue and earnings trends, so that you should be able to you know at the very least eyeball you know the the overall trends, right? So if instead, instead of them showing to you in like this, if you just had a you know some bar graphs, right? You should be able to eyeball, hey, this is a company that isn't really growing their revenues. Actually, if I look at it on a trend, is actually decreasing revenues. So, you know, this is something that every single uh, brokerage firm has access to historical financial statements, um, and most of them will plot it for you on a chart. I find plotting it on the chart just visually, I can quickly gauge. Hey, is this trending in the right direction or not? Are you still going to take this Thursday's meetings? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, uh, Dan is only taking over the options education Thursday sessions. Um, as uh, for those of you that may not. Uh, no yet. My wife and I are expecting our first child here in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so at this point, you know, we want to make sure that you guys have continuity in terms of education. So once my wife gives birth, um, Dan Passarelli, who we just, I did a session with on Tuesday afternoon for some of you that attended, he will be taking over uh, about three, about four to five education sessions while I take a few weeks off. Um, but during that time, uh, Dan will be taking over, and we will also have Prakash stepping in on the Tuesday market outlook session. So we've got you covered across all of the sessions that we host. Um, you will not expect, you will not see any disruptions to any of the sessions that we host on Tuesday, on Thursday, and even the Friday rapid fire sessions. Any future class on pre-earning strategies? Often those stocks get overhyped and reverses direction. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a particular uh, class on that. I'll be honest. I, I don't really think of those things as necessarily that important. Um, you know, and there's no way, in my opinion, that you'll ever be able to gauge how the market is going to react. That's the one thing that you can't gauge. You can gauge largely, you know, to some degree, whether you think the stock's going to beat or miss, what's almost impossible to gauge is how the market's going to react to that. Um, I don't think there's really a template for that, in my opinion. Do you get the profit and revenue data from the Q10 reports or from the company's website? So you can, but I think that's a lot of work. Most brokerage, firm most brokerage firms aggregate all of this stuff for you. So you shouldn't have to go to the SEC website or the company's website to get this type of stuff. 
um, you know, your broker term aggregates all of it. So you can just type in the symbol into your, you know, thinkorswim or whatever platform you use, and they should be able to show you the financial statements or a chart of the historical primary, uh, you know, some of the most important things, which are revenue and EPS, earnings per share. Um, with that, that covers the questions that I have time for here today. I really appreciate you taking your time out here this afternoon uh, to listen to, you know, how to think about earnings season and hopefully giving you a better understanding as to what you want to look for in your research when you're thinking about how do I think about stocks that are going to beat or miss on earnings? And thank you so much for those of you that said congratulations. I really appreciate it. Um, and I really look forward to um, having Dan on when, when the baby comes. But until then, I will be here. Um, and I expect to be here probably at least for the next couple of weeks or so. But with that, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great trading day. Um, we don't have a rapid fire session tomorrow morning, but I will be sending everyone the chart book so that you will see my macro view on the broader markets, the sector rotation and the individual names that we are paying attention to in this market. With that, thank you so much. Have a great trading day. And I'll see you guys here next week on the Tuesday Market Outlook session. Have a good night.